we were working on several stories that we heard about the emerald mines. And it was captivating because the emeralds from Afghanistan are some of the most beautiful in the world. So we decided to try to take a trip and investigate further. It's in the Panjshir Valley. People have said it's one of the most majestic, beautiful valleys in the world. And we weren't disappointed. I found Ahmed Duad at the bottom of a 60-meter mine. He was wrangling a pneumatic rock drill, mining a promising vein, hoping to find a beautiful, perfect emerald that would bring a great sum of money. The most efficient way to illuminate anything in the mine is to use these handheld gas lamps. And they emit this very yellow tone throughout the mine. And then the dust, as they're picking at these promising veins, filters that light and makes this soft, kind of cloudy view of the world. As I watch Ahmed Jawad manhandle that pneumatic drill, it looks like he's handling a machine gun. And the difference is not very strong between the man holding the gun fighting for his life and Ahmed Jawad holding the pneumatic drill, also fighting for his life, trying to find a future by digging this, in this rock. Rockstone house where they live in the sheer face of the Hindu Kush is breathtaking. Not only because it's so high, you're trying to catch your breath, but also because the view is incredible. You can see the valley floor, where the homes are, where the families are. And you can see the tops of the mountains that are climbing up to the, the top of the sky. They can go for days at a time before they find the stone they're looking for. So when they come out and they start to find those best stones, it's a real celebration. When they came out of the Emerald Mine, the light was soft in the afternoon. Everybody gathered together in a hushed tone, talking about how beautiful it was, complimenting the different qualities of the light coming off the stone. This was the promise they were looking for. I think the book's special because there's a lot of different hands that help make the quality of this book. It's an American photographer covering a story in Afghanistan, creating the book in Pakistan, having it printed in Lahore, and a printer that has beautiful German presses with imported European papers. It's a stunning effort. The people of Afghanistan just have a beautiful spirit. And the imagery really mirrors that. The people are beautiful, the scenery is beautiful. It's hard to translate that. This book really captures that. If you want to bring something to teach somebody about what Afghanistan is in its heart and soul, Bring this book and start to touch that. Yes, Afghanistan is heaven. But the people themselves are not the world. They want so much more. supply. 
supplies, canisters, uh, food for the week, one, one week's worth of supply. We climb up hinges where the, at the, the park in the Pinchier Valley where most of the families live and work in the mine. Hinge is at about 7,000 feet and the top of the mountains that rise above the Pinchier Valley are 17,000 feet and the miners live somewhere at 12,000 feet. So I climbed the mountains, it took me five hours. Two and a half hours into the climb, the porter who carried my equipment up to the top of the mountain met me on the way down and I paid it. <laughs> I completed another two hours to get to the point. So when, we, when I arrived in this one room building, which you saw in that one stunning photograph from above the mountain, and we spent the first day and the evening as they were cooking the meal, there's a story, storytelling tradition as you sit together in the mines with that glow of the one lamp illuminating all the faces. And there were older men, like the man, um, uh, Latif, who is the one who's praying the cover of the book. And he would start to tell stories about his days as a Mujahideen, fighting the Russians, the great pride he had in going to the Solon Pass, defeating the Russians, taking the equipment apart piece by piece, and burrowing it away into the emerald mines to use later. And while those stories were being told, there was a young man listening. And he didn't speak very much, so the next morning I talked to him. And he said, yeah, these men, they tell their stories all the time. And yeah, they're enlightening. I thought you must be so proud. It's great. But what is there for me? Latif had a moment where he could be proud of his community. He did something amazing. And he had a great identity. And at 22 year old, years old, Jawad had gone to a madras as a child. He went to Kabul and got uh, two years of education. But ultimately didn't find work or anything meaningful for him. And he returned back to his valley and decided in despair that there was no future for him. So he decided to go into the emerald mines, finding a stone which would earn him enough money to be able to get his, smuggle his way out of the country if necessary, was the answer for him. And how did you, why did you feel out of this entire your experience with that son? Why did you decide to make him your son? I think we've talked a lot about journalism here and and how you make a story, why you make a story. Initially, as you said in the New York Times, we discussed this as a story about emeralds, about the mineral wealth of Afghanistan. And certainly, there that's part of the story, and that's part of the bigger political story. But as a photographer, we need to make that human. And I was able to do that because, um, as you said in the introduction, I'm American, but my mother's German. My mother was seven years old during World War II. So as a child, I would hear stories of my mother running from school to home, hearing the great sirens and dashing into bomb shelter. Uh, I heard stories of one day the military came to her house, knocked on the door, and said, it's time for your father to join the army, and he disappeared. He was wounded, he survived the war, but those traumatic events stayed with her, and she told me that as a child. So when she became a young woman at 20, she married an American soldier and then moved to America. Instead of waiting for her country to go 10 years as it rebuilt itself, she decided to find another path out of her, out of her world. <coughs> Not that my parents don't love each other, they've been married 60 years, so I think it worked out very well. But that understanding of how war affects a whole generation and will destroy your youth, when I looked at Jawad, I said, I recognize this story. This is not just the Afghan story. Right. You covered a lot of conflicts. Um, how is this one different? It's amazing. The reason, one of the reasons that I came to understand that this story was important was I showed a lot of photography about war. I photographed, the, I covered Iraq for oh, from 2004 until 2011, when Americans left, a lot for the New York Times. I have pictures of the trauma and trauma of war. And I think we just can't take it. We can't really relate to it, and it turns us off. And so when I show pictures of, of violence, it doesn't capture you, it doesn't inform you. So if I'm going to these places and spending time with people, what I want to present when I come back to speak to people is a story that will encapsulate what I've learned 
As a photographer, what we're looking for is the best scenario to illustrate the situation. The Penshire Valley is a scenario of a young man laboring, trying to find resources to create an identity and a, and a life for himself. That happens in Iraq, that happens here in the streets, that happens in Peshawar, but this was the most photogenic situation I could find.
Uh, I stayed in the house and they brought out their the birds in the bird cages and we enjoyed that. We got exchange stories with each other. And in that nature, you you can bring humanity to life. So it changed me in the sense that that never left me. There's lots I can present, but the Jawad story and these emerald miners is, is one of the most special ones. Well, I did the story, and I kept it in touch with the miners. <clears throat> and um, through my own life, uh, I wanted to, to marry a very beautiful lady that I met overseas. And uh, I did turn to the father of uh, uh, the Emerald Miners that allowed me to come in. And uh, I said, it's time to get engaged. He said, I have just a stone for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to say that I brought one special stone with me, and it's on the finger of my wife, who's sitting right here. <laughs> so speaking of emerald, um, I'm a huge fan as well, but what do you <laughs> put it out there? What's the economics? What is the economics of this industry, especially in a place like Panchi Valley, which is kind of like this last pocket left within Afghanistan, you know, given the history that we, I mentioned earlier. Yeah. How does the politics of Afghanistan Valley and the Emerald Industry. Yeah, let me get up that. I'll show you a photograph. I think we need to dim the lights a little bit. Um, can we go to the next photograph, I think? Uh, one more, I forgot. And then can we have these, turn these lights on? Yeah, maybe this one too. Uh, go one more, sorry. Yes, this is what you He's so here you can see him cresting over this this uh, ridge, and behind him what you see is a catacomb of emerald mines that have been bored into the mountain. So what happens is there's the Indian tectonic plate, there's the Asian tectonic plate, and they've made the Hindu Kush this amazing mountain range. So what happens for emeralds? You need a certain amount of geological events to happen. Obviously, you need pressure. You need a, a hard surface like granite or shale or another type of ge geological uh, hard surface to come up against another surface and then for there to be a small um, uh, zone of morphic activity. So maybe that's hot lava or maybe that's superheated water. Coming through those very uh, hot events of tectonic movement. And that happens in the Panchir Valley uh, in a 1.3 kilometer band. It happens on the east side of the, of the valley, but it does not happen on the west side of the valley. And that band goes up and down the mountain at irregular spaces. And this is the band that you see here. Uh, apparently the story goes that in the early 70s, a uh, sheep herder was on the mountain and kind of slipped and fell and was grappling around and came upon this unbelievably beautiful stone. And they came to learn that was emerald. That happened in the 70s, so it's, we're around, they, there was actually the first geological survey I found was in 1977 that the communists have done about emeralds in Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey did another uh, survey after 2001 when they were trying to look at the economics of emeralds and the viability of them. So the miners, this is not 20 years of generations of, this is not, you know, 10 generations of, of miners. Ultimately, that old generation from the 70s who found the rocks, and they just started to do it unregulated without training. So, as a result, you'll see this mine started, that mine starting. If that's promising, that'll go deep. But the other thing that happens is Ahmed Jawad is part of one team of miners, and he's connected to a family. So, there might be 55 partners in that family. And then there might be another family that are competing on a different uh, opening, and they will be blasting the rock their own schedule. So it's happened, I was in the, in the mine, we were mining, and the whole mine rocks, shakes, turns to dust. <laughs> and you know what's happening, and they look at you, and they just know, oh, it's fine, it's normal. The adjacent mine had exploded their dynamite, and they didn't tell anybody. That's, that's 
interesting. So with the conflict of world diamonds, you have people who exist on land who are pushed off the land, who another group has come and has suppressed them into doing the mining, and then taken the well from the mines and used them for their own meat. So that does not exist here in the Panjshir. And the other thing that's interesting is that so the Panjshir Valley is a Tajik uh, ethnic group. This is their ancestral home. They're not pushed out of this. This is something they discovered and they're reaping the benefit from. So, as far as the conflict issue, that's not the case. It is the case that when Ahmad Shah Massoud was fighting the Soviets, when the Soviets tried to enter their valley, they took these emeralds, they took them to Peshawar, they made wealth off of them, and they bought weapons to protect, <coughs> to protect themselves. So, it is true during that time, they used these directly for weapons to support themselves. And is there nefarious activities that happen when they buy emeralds today? Certainly, it's up to them. So the problem that they discovered was that, or the benefit that Afghanistan as a whole should be getting from emeralds is that you should mine them, you should take them out, the government should get a maybe a 15% tax, and then you know, the state and the people of the pension rather get the benefit. Um, apparently it was almost a, a, a revolt when the government tried to do this before and come to the pinch here and try to exact the tax. So it exists as almost a semi-autonomous zone, so it, it's difficult to uh, exact attacks over them. Right. Now, we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to just, uh, before we get questions from the audience, so I'm going to move towards photo journalism now. A bit. I want to show you one thing, if I can. We go to the next slide. Now we're going to sit here and let him sign. This is what you've been waiting for, this is what happened. This is the real. This is the real. The real deal. Yeah, so when uh, Ahmed Dwad's father brought out that packet of, let me show you some real emeralds. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's back here. Um, I just wanted to hammer that thought away about what we're going to call people, how are we going to name people. So I thought that was one of the, main, the central points of the book. So now moving back to the question which I asked you yeah. earlier, how did you decide? By the way, the, the slide you're seeing is not doing justice to the pictures you have to get the book to actually see how beautiful the pictures are and the photographs. But tell us a little bit about the sequence of it, because I'm sure there's so much that you saw. How did you decide to put it in the order that you did? It's a, the subject is narrow. A lot of people you know, said you should do a, a broad book all about Afghanistan. It's narrow about the country battle. And I put the sequence of images together. It took me two years to find the right sequence. So when you go through the book, um, first you start. Let me show one picture here. The only picture <clears throat> that I really show of violence is a child playing on the, the destroyed barrel of a Russian tank. So this is your kind of opening two page spread here. So immediately I want to establish there is some history of violence here. And then there's two children who are outside kind of believing themselves. I want to immediately get into the sense of village life. It's actually quite innocent. And you're actually quite intimate. You know everybody, and everybody knows you and who you are and where you belong. Um, so I wanted to get that sense in the book immediately. And then from there, of course, you travel up into the mountain, you go into the mines, and you start to get the texture of life. So, but one of the things I discovered when we were up there for five days, they said, okay, there are no miners, they're going to go downtown and do a festival. I thought, well, that's interesting, but maybe it's off topic, really. And uh, when I got down, the festival they were doing was a game called Boskashi, if you're familiar with that. It's a game played on horseback. It dates back to Genghis Khan's ancient times. It's basically a game of a man on horseback, and there's a, a circle drawn on both sides of the field. And there's two teams opposing each other, trying to use a ball, which is called, this guy should mean goat pulling. So essentially it's a goat with its head cut off, filled with 50 pounds of rock, and then the horseman jump and does, uh, uh, take the goat and try to put it in a circle on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> So play the next slide. And this is that photograph. So here you can see the chapman does, the horseman there on the, with the uh, boskeshi, the goat. This, they used the cap at this point, hanging from the horse on the right side. Uh, so then you can see all the men, there's some of his teammates protecting him and some in opposition to him trying desperately to grab him. This is the photograph that initially had me decide, I, I need to share this picture because people are drawn to this, they're captivated by this picture, and it's just gorgeous. I've seen Boskeshi play in Afghanistan a lot in Kabul. It's played between different kind of, uh, what do you say, wealthy men, and then played for the glory of the wealthy men. This game was played between villagers, so when you go to uh, the man who's making, uh, the, the, making the bread, the man who's selling the items, each shop has their special horse uh, reins and bridle hanging the shop walls, and they've all made little uh, refinements to make them personalized. And it was in the fall, the colors were just absolutely spectacular. So that is one of the, you have quite a few of this. Yeah, the one, so I'll show you one more picture. Oh, wow. How did you, okay, where were you when you took this? <laughs> Um, this gives you a chance to see 
Uh, I mean, that's a traditional Panjshir coat that uh, even uh, Karzai wears because it represents the Panjshir. You can see the bridal handmaid with all the little divots. You can see the small plume on top. And even uh, here, I think we can recognize these saddlebags that sometimes we see in the shops. So, in a sense, I want you to be able to take something away. There's a lot of people come to visit Pakistan and then they go away with something. We don't have to steal something or kind of take something from we can take a story and we can share that, and I feel like that has as much value as a creative thing. Speaking of sharing, I mean, there's so much that you get as a viewer from a photograph that you do, sometimes from an artist, or even a video, um, a video report. Do you think that this is the century of photographs? Do you think photojournalism, photojournalism is the future of, of news and media? Do you think that's what people want to know, or that's what people are drawn, you know, being drawn to? It's been an amazing to be part of this event. So yesterday I was in Hong Kong, I was signing some books. And uh, two gentlemen came up to me and they were captivated by the books. They didn't say anything. They were just aging books. And it came to light that these men, they're from Baluchistan, they said, so where's, where's this? Is it Afghanistan? We do this in Baluchistan. We're so excited. <laughs> I, we do this, I've never seen it photo, photographed like this. They haven't seen themselves in that They've never seen themselves in that So, there's a great opportunity for photographic storytelling. We have a beautiful culture here where we're, we've heard, you know, there's beautiful books on the whole way. We've great, and we have panels that are works of fiction talking about different issues about people because we feel, I mean, those are quite effective in that sense. But you can make quite effective, beautiful photography of people in these scenarios that you want to express. Um, what happens a lot is that, you know, somebody comes from abroad and then they do a story that they need to tell people from where they live. And so the disconnect comes with the people that get upset is that you don't project to us or you don't show us in a respectful way or a way that we think is, is great. So I think that's a great opportunity here. Like in Pakistan, people come from beautiful imagery and they make beautiful photographs. There's a great opportunity here to go into places that are not accessed for long enough. And understanding that great photographs have great value because then you will communicate yourself so much more powerfully with people. And in a culture here, I mean, the, it's a verbal culture, it's also a visual culture. And I think that that will develop here and that is a great opportunity when you're thinking about Another column that we talked about was that how physically some of the cities are changing to make walls or block off the view. And certainly we know about people allowing access. It's important to think about why you allow access and that allowing access will actually benefit you because people will be able to make beautiful pieces of art and express what they see in the culture much better. Thank you, Max. Thank you for this informative uh, talk. We're now going to open up Questions from uh, audience members who would like to ask? Okay. Hi there. Hi. Um, I do belong to Poetia and Balochistan, so I'm very happy. Uh, my question to you is how are the Panjshir data emeralds different from those belonging to Colombia, Zambia, or Samar? And why did you choose Afghanistan as your place of research rather than any other location? And the third part is, was it easier being a man and going to those areas? Had you been a female, would it be different? Mm -hmm. Good questions. Three-part question. Yeah, three, you have to help me keep track. So, first I'll attack, uh, to talk about the, um, the issue of the stones. So, Colombia is actually quite well known for beautiful emeralds as well. And the benefit for Colombia is that they have access to the international uh, market to sell their stones. It's easier for North Americans to purchase them and there's less uh, a perception of an ethical problem buying such stones. They also have a slightly different color. So when I talk about those tectonic issues happening with, with pressure, what you also need is beryllium. And so beryllium is an element that also has to be in there. It's just quartz otherwise. But if you insert beryllium, they turn green. And then the, the amount that uh, beryllium exists means that the Afghan emeralds have a darker hue. Colombian emeralds might have a little bit, a slightly bluer hue. Um, 
The other thing is that Columbia emeralds are mined in a much more efficient way. This is the, the worst way to, to mine emeralds. You, what they do essentially is take fertilizer and some kind of gunpowder substance, they put a fuse in it, they drill a hole, and then they light it and run out, and they blast the rock. Emerald is very delicate, so many times that shreds or destroys the best parts of the emerald. Um, I mean, they have one example that's just making me think of. They were telling me in the mine when one guy, you were talking, this relates to the issue of family, actually, that you also talked about. So families do then fund these young men who are actually in the rocks, and children aren't necessarily, I didn't see young children, there's certainly teens in the mines helping, but young children do things like run the donkeys up and down, they support the men in the shops that are bringing the supplies up and down. And one man told a story of he was, uh, because as a result of all the fighting for the Soviets, there's munitions in the mountains, there's bombs that didn't explode. So a common practice was to see this as a gift and get the dynamite and the explosive out of these bombs. And very often that's explosive they use to uh, further their work in the mine. So he's telling me a story, it was, it was him and it was his friend, they were both tapping the bomb to try to open it, to try to get the explosives out. Uh, he thought for a minute, actually my position's not, not great. I'm just gonna sit over here behind a rock. As soon as he moved and put himself behind the rock, the explosion happened right behind him. And he said he just turned around and he saw his friends jump in the air. So it was quite, quite dangerous work. But the issue of women, there's one picture, I do have one picture. Yeah, I asked you about those, I was like, I there's one picture. Yeah. So, and the other, well, only other woman is a Bollywood actress that's a, a picture in a flip mirror that the, the men bring with them in the mine. So, uh, yeah. I wanted to touch on this issue of here is a picture of a woman in a burka, which is a thing that all kind of people come and they photograph and they say, oh, look at this situation. So I wanted to make sure that the burka wasn't the composition. You have the beauty of the village as the composition, and you have the woman, you know, traveling between her home, getting bread for the morning, uh, in a way that's appropriate for that village, is, is, is how everybody else sees her. Um, and I also, the other thing that was part of that is if these men themselves, if they can provide for their families in a better way, if they can make more money, if this might make it more efficient, the situation of the women at home would be improved as well. That would free them up from being in a, in a hard economic place to being able to think about making business for themselves or being educated.
engineers abroad, looking at the family structure, uh, the support that I'm to willing to use, it makes me miss my family a little bit. So we're going to go back to the United States uh, for another posting for three or four years, and then hopefully arrive with new eyes somewhere else. Thank you. Um, hi. Yeah, I think you said you saw you did this story a few years ago. Do you know what happened to our pet? Yes. So this story ran in the New York Times as part of a, a blog, and then um, I had these experiences at school, and so uh, two years ago I started working on the book, and then a week before I came here to Lahore, I called uh, one of the cousins of Ahmed Jawad to so try to see if could I track him down. What happened? Did he make it to Europe? He said, unfortunately, things got things got good for a while. The NATO force was starting to leave. His friend had made a trucking business, and so they participated in that. So they had a good industry for a while. Uh, and then a year ago, the trucking industry just you know dispersed as all the NATO supplies were, were gone. And Ahmed Jawad's now returned to the mines. He didn't find his stone. And he wanted to leave, and did, did he want to go to He wanted to get to Europe just because he think he saw a path to get there, and that would be the best. So he didn't. He, what he did he know what he would do there? He had no idea. It was just that the, the mountain of getting to Europe or somewhere where he thought he could make a living for himself better uh, seemed insurmountable. So he was just really content and set on trying to accomplish that. I think it'd be really interesting for him to actually see this book now. Yeah.
you are a great photographer, you love social media, your Instagram feed can be about these issues that unfortunately, news artists, they don't necessarily, um, they have limited resources to do, and they have maybe limited staff, but also with that, if it takes, you know, somebody to get into the Emerald Mines, to get the access, to get the permission from the father, I went to Afghanistan to done five, six, seven, three years of knowing somebody until I was invited. If I went uninvited, I probably could go to the mines. Could I stay three nights? No. Would I go to be invited to Boskeshi? That was their village event. No. So that takes a long time to be posted to then get that access. And I think that's, that's a very important point is how the journalist actually creates those Yeah, and I think that also, you know, if you're living here and you you know something that needs to be told, your ability to help help somebody access that is very important. Um, yeah. Um, fantastic photographs, and through your speech, Matt, it's really evident that you really care and you really connected with all the people you've met. Um, and it's great hearing you. And it's really interesting that you, you've you not only, you know, you've got the book and you can go online and see your photographs or on the other times, but you're going to schools as well. And, and that's something new for me, you know, to hear a journalist who's taking these pictures to school. So you're trying to pass on that connection that you found. Do you plan to do more of that? And do you think that's almost essential, really? Because that's another avenue of access for a whole new generation. It's true. In a way, you would think that the best way for me to reach them is to tweet about it or use Instagram to try to follow themselves on it. Um, but what I'm finding is when, in the book, actually, that's a new tactile experience. And then also, it gives you the ability, you, when you open the book, you are on the subject of the book. When I open the tablet, I want many subjects that I cannot concentrate on. <laughs> so the delivery system is different. But I am very excited about going to the United States. I mean, one thing you were talking about is that where will I go next? And thinking about, okay, I'm going to go to the U.S. When I go to the U.S., and when you, we talk about perceptions a lot about what people in the United States think, you know, things abroad, and you as a person, probably the only person that many people will come in contact who is actually there, they ask me, so what's it like? That is the question. And I have 15 minutes to make that an answer that they can digest. If in that 15 minutes I show you, here's a picture of a fall, bomb falling in Gaza, it's okay. Or here's a picture of the bombing of a shower, it's horrible, I can't take it in, I'm passing on what you have to say. But in that 15 minutes I say, well let me tell you about Ahmadjua, he's an emerald miner. The emeralds are gorgeous, but what he wants is just to mine the stone, get the money, and go to where you are. That's going to make them think about that story in a much more connected way. That's really why I want to bring this book. Um, also, I think, I think you asked whether when his next book would come out. Is that what you were talking about? the next, okay. the next project. Oh, okay. well, the next project, yeah. The next project, actually, so I talked about my mother quite a bit. And so when she would tell me stories about Max and Moritz, you know, it's this German fairy tale, so that's great. But in between that, I heard those stories when I was, you know, five or six years old about her going in the bomb shelter, uh, about her uncle going to the Ukraine and being killed on the Russian front. And this kind of so as a result, I have a lot of photographs that I drew that are of the war. Um, and so my next book, I want to reflect on that sense of what child, what, how children reflect on the war and, and just that. Just to post pictures from my childhood drawing the war to the actual conflicts that I saw. Uh, and hopefully make that deeper by maybe going into, um, especially the, the maybe children of soldiers or even children who are in traumatic event, uh, events. Because uh, I know that there's also psychologists working with the children of the shower attack to have them draw and express themselves that way. Yeah. Hi, Max. How are you? Hello. Um, uh, what kind of photographs would you like to, apart from that project, what kind of photographs would you like to take in the United States? It's going to be pretty interesting for you returning home after being in orbit um, all this time. And uh, 
the US is a pretty interesting country right now. Um, I'm interested to know what kind of photographs you'd like to take there if you have an idea. On a, for, on a technical level, uh, for those of us who arrived late, is it possible to have the photos kind of go rolling behind you? Or sure, that yeah. 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 So what, I will, uh, it's a very good question. Do you want to start from the beginning and then you can go through them? I'll answer uh, the question. It is a great experience having come 10 years abroad, and then we're going to be in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm from California. And the South of America, the, the American South, the Deep South, as it's called, is a place I haven't explored and discovered. But the thing that many people on this side of the world will be surprised about is the amount of poverty that exists in the Deep South. And I think it will be interesting to be able to draw these parallels about how much of a struggle daily life is. If I find it difficult to try to get this emerald, at the very least, he has the support of a community. There's many people who are marginalized in the United States. Maybe they live in, a, in another community that isn't as supportive. Or they rely on trying to get a leg up in the state or access to education. There's some very basic issues that are also at play in the United States that deserve to be highlighted. It's going to be fascinating to see, to go into these communities now and, and explore those issues. It'll be fantastic. Plus, there's a we're going to have another U.S. election, which also gives a reason for people to reflect on themselves and what policies are. Here, we're like in this, in the, the realm of this conversation that we've had in before. We've talked about the U.S. in these very general terms, and even Americans talk about themselves and Republican or not Republican. So, what I really want to do is go to communities where it's going to be specific stories that will be beyond these ideas. Of we say red and blue in the United States, it's terrible. Because when soldiers talk about an enemy they want to kill, they, they make a, a word that disassociates themselves with it. And this political conversation that uses this lexicon is also as dangerous. The thing is, living abroad and being in places where people speak dangerous speech and have dangerous actions, you realize how close one is after the other. And so I, I also be coming to the United States and trying to exploring kind of these these issues that will have set with me at this experience. Great. We have uh, five minutes left, so just one question. <clears throat> well, my question is about Manila next, because I think all of us, like me, many of us are so absorbed in your uh, uh, photographs that uh, we would like to see more and more. So the next question is that uh, uh, do you have any plans to come to Pakistan in your next, and uh, if you come to Pakistan, so what would you like to put on that? We'd love to have an accent. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to, yes. It's been a beautiful three-year experience. And I think these young men who came to, from Baluchistan invited me to come to see their natural resources and the way they, they harvest stones. Um, I would like to do more of that. There's a lot of unexplored places. <clears throat> when I was at Topical, Topical was a printer here in the board um, that I talked about in the movie. Uh, there were many men who were, um, they were in privileged positions, so they formerly retired, they were in the military, so they had access to places that are unbelievably beautiful in Pakistan. But maybe, but as they took photographs, they took them more for recreation, and then in, the, in their, their time of retirement, reflected and realized that those are actually some of the best, most beautiful parts of the country that they're most proud of, and they made them into books. The tragedy is they had the access, <clears throat> but they did not take the time or have the skill to present the images in a compelling way that will stay with people and express themselves in pictures visually to the extent that is satisfactory or that they wanted to. So I, I hope to access maybe through the official channel or by, again, a lot of things are invited by the elders to get access to things like that. Because being in Pakistan, I've, I've worked hard to get places that are beautiful. And unfortunately, it's difficult to get there. It does take living here to, to reach those places. But my God, what a beautiful country to have, right? It's unbelievably beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Max, for uh, your answers, for sharing your experience with us. I think you're quite lucky.